Hi everyone, welcome to our exploration of Misa Solemnus. It's a three part series because this piece is one mother of a Misa and we'll get to that in a bit. So today we're going to give a little background of the piece. We're gonna do a warm up, which is totally necessary if you're gonna conquer Misa Solemnus. And we're gonna talk about two aspects of the piece and take sort of one or two trips through the work. Next time, we're gonna talk about fugues and we're just gonna have one big fugathon sing. And then the last time, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, the vocalism needed to get through this piece and why it is so Beethoven. Uh, I'd like to thank Berkshire Choral International for everything that they do. I'm so proud to be associated with the organization and to know that even during this time, they are continuing their mission of giving everyone the opportunity to explore their greatness through song. I'm just, I, I couldn't be happier for BCI and everything that they're doing. So let's dive in. So we begin our three part journey with this huge piece with a little bit of background. So as we all know, Beethoven lived from 1770 to 1827. And he wrote this piece in 1823, or at least he completed the piece in 1823. So quite near the end of his life. And to give you some context, 1803, was when he wrote Eroica. The Fidelio, his lone opera, was 1805. We have the Mass in C Major, which is his other large uh, liturgical work. That was 1807 to 1812. It took him a while to write it. Uh, his Eighth Symphony was 1812. His Hammerklavier Sonata was 1817. And the Ninth Symphony was 1824. He finished that after he finished Misa Solemnus. And it is a massive work. It is 83 minutes long, which is longer, yes, than Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And the, each movement is its own little piece. It has five movements, as you would expect from a mass. So it has the Kyrie, which is 11 minutes, 11 minutes for one, two, three, four, five, six, 18 words, 11 minutes. You can do the math on that one. The Gloria is 17 minutes long. The Credo is 22 minutes long. The Sanctus is 17 minutes long. And finally, the Agnus Dei, the final movement is 16 minutes long. So each of these is its own piece. And in this work, Beethoven has put everything as I say, everything but the kitchen sink. So we have in it a large orchestra and I'll break this little notation down for you. That means two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, three bassoons, one of which is a contra bassoon. So the, the bassoon that's an octave lower. We have four horns, two trumpets, three trombones, no tuba, timpani, organ and strings. We of course have our full SATB chorus. And we have four soloists and there's a violin solo in it. So the concert master has basically an entire movement of a concerto in the middle of this. We have some opera we, with some uh, recitative and some aria type singing. We have basically um, what equates to some symphonic writing. We have fugues lots of fugues, but that's not for today. We have, as I said, a violin concerto stuck in the middle of this thing. We have chant referenced. We have pastoral beauty. I mean, this piece ends just like the pastoral symphony does, symphony number six. We have sheer reverence. We have, I mean, just the most beautiful musical prayers. And then we have a little bit of irreverence too. And and we have tradition. He follows many of the rules set forth in the Catholic mass tradition as, as um, Haydn would have, uh, have 
um, embodied. And then we also have quite a bit of rebellion from that tradition. And we'll hit a little bit of each one of those as we go through the next three days. So I wanted you to understand a little bit about my relationship with the Mesa Solemnus. So you can sort of see why I'm taking you through it in this slightly disjunct manner. And I'll start with my time in the Atlanta Symphony Chorus. This was 1990 to 1991. I was a senior in high school and I was the youngest chorus. And we, we really sang some of the most incredible rep. We did Beethoven 9, we did uh, Mahler 2, Mahler 8, Dvorak Te Deum. I mean, it, we were all over the place in terms of our rep. And I came out of that year with a great sense of understanding Standing of how a chorus and orchestra puts together um, a great piece of work. So I, I will be honest that I thought I sort of knew everything at that point about choral orchestral works. But yeah, I didn't. So when I got to college and I went to Northwestern, I decided I was going to go and hear the Chicago Symphony Chorus do Beethoven's Misa Solemnus. So I I went and I can't remember exactly which year, hence the question mark. And I, I sat through thinking that I would understand it, thinking that I would just be able to conquer that listening experience. Well, I was wrong. So I walked away from that thinking, what the heck just happened? I, I didn't understand it. I didn't really like it. And I thought something was wrong with me because I didn't like it. And I just, I sort of walked away from that totally flummoxed about my future in music and about who Beethoven was. So then uh, in 1996, I, I met my boyfriend who is now my husband. Uh, he was a violist and he still plays and, and he introduced me to the string quartets of Beethoven and I started listening to those quite a bit. And then I started studying orchestral conducting along with my choral conducting degree. And I'll say that that's a whole other topic. I believe strongly that there shouldn't be this big division between choral and orchestral conducting, but that's a whole other uh, summit or semester or seminar. So anyway, we studied the Beethoven symphonies. And so I started to dive into those scores. Then in around 2000, I was living back in Georgia and teaching and um, I was working for the Savannah Symphony and also singing in the Atlanta Symphony Chorus again. And lo and behold, we got to do Misa Solemnus. I got to sing Misa Solemnus. And so John Nelson was the conductor and of course, uh, Norman McKenzie was preparing it and it was so difficult and so rewarding. And with all of my knowledge of the Beethoven symphonies and the Beethoven string quartets behind me, I started to get a hold of the piece a little bit more. Then I went to Peabody for my doctorate. And at that point, I started diving into this piece for real. And I decided to make it my doctoral dissertation because as I was diving into it, I realized that no one really talked about it in a way that matched my experience with it. And uh, as we go through the next th three seminars, you'll sort of start to understand my experience with it a little bit more. So I realized that I needed to explore it on my own terms, not in other people's terms. So that's why it was my dissertation. So then in 2007, I got appointed or I, I started my position as the director of the Richmond Symphony Chorus. And I really wasn't aware at the time the, the um, beginnings of that ensemble. And actually right now we're, about, we're embarking in our 50th anniversary season. And it turns out that the first concert of the Richmond Symphony Chorus was actually the Misa Solemnus. And it was uh, uh, Jim Erb gathered singers together to create the Richmond Symphony Chorus to sing the Misa Solemnus under the direction of 
Robert Shaw. So here it was, I was taking over the reins of this chorus that had this beginning in my own tradition, that Robert Shaw tradition. So then it we were reaching our 40th anniversary, which would have been 2011, 10, 11 season. And in 2009, we were sort of between music directors at that point. And so I was the lone conductor on staff as, as the associate conductor and the chorus master. And so I said, okay, I'm just gonna do it. So I walked in to the executive director's office and I said, David, our 40th anniversary is coming up and I think we should do Misa Solemnis uh, to celebrate. And I think I should conduct it. And he said, okay. And I walked out of that office and I thought, oh my gosh, what just happened? I, now I have to do Mises Solemnis. I had written my dissertation on it. I had gone through this whole history and I knew it was the hardest piece in the repertoire. And I thought, what have I gotten myself into? Well, what happened is I ended up spending a lot of additional time at the Yale Library, all of Mr. Shaw's archives are. Um, and I created my own edition based on much of what Mr. Shaw taught me uh, what, uh, through being able to sing with him as a, as a young singer, but also being able to learn from his notes at the, at the library. And I put together an edition and I, I bought my own orchestra parts and I worked with the concert master of the orchestra and we marked them all up and, and I really thought carefully about how we were going to go through this process as an organization. And it ended up that we had our performance in May of 2011 and Jim Erb himself even sang in that performance. So I'm really excited to be able to revisit this piece again in this three part series. Uh, but I wanted to dive into a little bit about why I was blindsided in that Chicago Symphony performance. And you know why I had this great education, I had this great experience going into Northwestern and going into this concert, how come no one told me about this piece? Well, uh, first of all, it, part of it is that it's not a good market value for ensembles. It, you know, it's just so hard to put together. It's so expensive. And again, there are people in the audience like me who don't really know what just happened. And so it's not a big seller like Beethoven 9 or Mozart Requiem. So it doesn't get programmed often. Uh, it is difficult. It is hard for the singers. It is hard for the orchestra. It is just not an easy piece. Uh, it is large, so it's expensive. It requires a large orchestra. It requires soloists who are just at the top of their game. And of course, a chorus who um, ha really has the time to commit to it. Um, it is an oddball work. And so, you know, as you, as you read about it, you read quotes like, the work replaced Fidelio as the great problem work of his career. I mean, this is a problem work? Okay. Uh, another good quote is, it was difficult to perceive it as a work by Beethoven at all. Okay, yeah, I did believe that when I first sat in there before I got to know the string quartets and, and the symphonies. And then, uh, Warren Kirkendall calls it reckless, and I like this entire quote. Okay, so the entire quote is, Beethoven indulges in such an endless, reckless, monumental wealth of mosaics that his contemporaries were dismayed. The accepted balance between form and content was distorted. An avalanche buried moderation and convention. The complete freedom, the maturity of a late style could not easily be comprehended. Timidly, the first reviewers voiced their discomfort at the fragmentation, the too rapid changes of key, tempo, and dynamics, the transitions too abrupt to be followed by the listener. And then finally, you know, my guy, Robert Shaw, called, called it uh, one mother of a Misa, or the exact quote is, this Misa's a mother, and that is exactly how he spelled it. So um, then it's also just incredibly difficult. So people just don't program this piece. So anyway, speaking of difficult, because this is most, the most difficult piece in the repertoire to sing, we're gonna do a good solid warm up. So um, 
here we go. I want you to stand up. I want you to follow all the instructions and really get your voice under you so that we can tackle the rest of this session together. And so what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to participate along with me. Um, I will tell you what to do. I do ask that if po possible, and this is for your own alignment, that you get the computer set so when you're standing, it has a pretty good feel. So like you can stand back from the computer. So this is not one of those activities where you have to be right up close to the computer. In fact, you shouldn't be because we're all tired of computers. So we're gonna start by making sure your feet are well balanced. If you are sitting, you should think about sitting on your alternate feet. So you're feeling the weight on those sit bones, not on the low back, okay? So just go back and forth between one foot and the other. We should see a lot of uh, dizzy zoom work here. Okay. Now I want you to go all the way over on your left foot, 80% of the weight on your left foot. Nice. Transfer 80% of your weight to your other foot. Okay, 70 on your left. 70% on your right. 60% on your left. 60 on your right. Now 50-50. Bend the knees a little bit. Okay. Hands up above the Zoom box. Touch the person above you in the Zoom box. And hands down. Shoulders up, back, down. Now, do that again. And when you go back, I want your sternum sort of aiming for oh, maybe a little place right above your head here. Okay. So shoulders up, back, sternum is up, and now your shoulders are down. Okay, check the 50-50 percentage in, on your feet. And now bring your hands out like this. Fill up your Zoom box. And, and almost like you're holding a big beach ball. So your palms are facing each other. Now invite some air in. And breathe out as you push the sides of your Zoom box. Invite the air in. Push the sides of your Zoom box. <sighs> Invite the air in for two. One, two, push the box out on S to six. S two, three, four, five, six. Invite the air in. One, two, out to nine. One, two, three, four, five, six seven, eight, nine, let the air in again for two, 13, S two, three, four, really push against the sides of the box so you're strong, I lost count, oh well, I'll have to start at nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, hold it, and relax. Ah, <sighs> okay, shoulders up, back, down. Now, can you hear the keyboard? Thumbs up, if you can hear the keyboard. Okay, great. So, on a nice hum, I want you to sing. Now, if you're fancy, you're still gonna have your arms out. And, ever, and invite the air in instead of sucking it in. Invite it in and push. start there put your hands down check your shoulders up back and down now this time each time you sing pick a different box and look at that person in the eyes pick someone else pick someone else 
someone else. into this I want you to match my vowel so I want you to really listen carefully to my vowel I'm going to start with nu and then I'm going to change it I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do you just have to listen nu. I'm going to go up a step I'm starting with nu again Starting with new again. This is your chance to sing with someone, hey, okay, to really hear vowel color. It's what you've been missing, isn't it? All right, here we go. New. forward towards your uh, your computer and stick out your tongue okay now relax your tongue and let it just sit sort of uh, near the near the bottom front teeth I'm going uh. all right so what I want to see in this next one is total relaxation of the mouth face neck while your sternum your ribs everything here is super strong so the exercise is this. So it might feel a little amorphous to you, but really relax tongue. And Take the whole entire time between exercises to breathe. Or I'll, as I'll say, to allow the air in. No sucking the air in at the last minute. Okay? So breathe. Divide into two, the upper half 
and the lower half. The lower half is strong like ox. The other ha upper half, you are a bobblehead. Okay, so you have to think here, here down is just super strong. Here up, you could do whatever with your head. See ya. you got to do this while you're singing, right? Prepare the high note by breathing for the high note. Instead of pretend like you're already singing the upper note when you breathe in. Ready? So think the high note. Here it is. Think it. Think it. Think it. And some tenors and basses here and this piece is notoriously high for the tenors and basses well and for the sopranos and altos too let's pop into the head voice so my exact pitch tenors and basses sopranos and altos also my exact pitch please and, my exact pitch not down the octave because you don't get my feedback, right? I mean, I don't get you, you don't get me, I can't hear you. So you have to go on how it feels. So now I want you to put your hand right here. Okay, we're gonna talk about how this feels to sing in your head voice. You should not feel any vibrations here. Go, ooh. Now go, ah. Oh. Do you feel the vibrations here? And that's this little, right above the sternum. So not really the neck, but right here. So go, ooh. Not a lot of vibration, right? And then, ah, oh, in your chest voice, you can feel that vibration. So I want you to keep it ooh, with no vibration and feel that. Feel that this is the sensation of singing. One and two. yet go the Chattanooga Choo Choo exercise. Okay, see if I can play it. Let's go, it goes. Doesn't that sound like the Chattanooga Choo Choo? When you hear the whistle blow, it's straight to the moon. But not like that. So it's Uh, 
right here at E. start to get harder because we're about to hit the first passaggio here up here that's that break in your voice either for tenors and basses or for us up here okay so you really have to breathe in that first pitch and this is for something in the beethoven all right uh let's start here no let's start here right there and high note now i'm warning you i'm going pretty high so if you're an outdoor bass and you want to take it down the octave you can up here going to come in a handy in a little bit. All right, now we have one. It's going to go like this. With a nice k on it. So I'm going to do that again. It's e. Okay, that's the first part. Do that. And the second is So the whole thing is school music days. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Okay, let's see if we remember these, because now you get to sing in canon in just a bit. If you don't remember them, it's okay. You'll remember them in a second. So it's a fist. Ready? 
do re mi fa so la ti do ti la so fa mi re do so you can try to do the hand signals you don't need to do them with me but you need to sing the right ones and all it is you're going to go scale up and down okay and you're not going to repeat the top note do re mi fa so la ti do ti la so fa mi re do now as long as you keep steady you'll be able to do this i'm going to start you off i'll sing the first two with you and then you got to keep going up and then I go out, I go in rogue. I'm gonna do a totally different thing. I'm just gonna go in canon with you, but, okay? So you start, you just sing the scale, and then we're gonna sing in harmony with each other, and it'll be a delight. Ready? There we go. Do, re, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, Finally, you get to sing some harmony, right? Yay! All right, at the end of each one of these, we do our applause, which is this. So fill the box with applause. All right, awesome. So now you just have to stick around for the rest of this to see how the Chattanooga Choo Choo and the <laughs> relate to Beethoven's Misa Solemnis. So, all right, thank you. That's all we're going to do for this warm up. Okay, so you're fully warmed up now. You're ready to sing and we're gonna sing some more in a minute. But first, a little bit of background and history about this work. So Beethoven was a notorious loner, much of it due to his, his hearing loss, but he did have one friend whom he adored and that was Archduke Ferdinand Rudolph. And the Archduke, uh, really respected Beethoven and allowed him to play music in his abode and Beethoven in turn dedicated several pieces of music to him. So when it became announced in 1819 that the Archduke was to become an Archbishop, Beethoven said, I will write a great coronation mass for you. So the uh, the installation was in 1820, and by the time the installation came, Beethoven had only finished the Kyrie and the Gloria, the first two out of five movements of this piece. And um, but it turns out he had actually started writing this music long before the announcement that the Archduke was to become Archbishop. And he continued working on it after that installation in 1820. So this was an all consuming project for him. He had a reason to write this beyond just the fact that his friend, the Archduke was going to become Archbishop. And here's another piece of evidence to that fact. Here's a great portrait of him by Josef Stieler. Um, it's from 1820. And what is he holding in his hand in this beautiful portrait, but a score to Misa Solemnis? And it's not a complete score, he's currently working on it. So this was a big deal for Beethoven. So what I discovered in you know, learning the string quartets and learning the symphonies and going through all of this and seeing that portrait and learning that Beethoven had started this piece before the commission and finished it long after there was any reason to finish it um, was that this piece was not an oddball piece after all. It was not something that was really so far outside of Beethoven's style that it couldn't even be considered a work by him at all, but rather it was the culmination of his mature style, everything sort of after that 1803 Eroica. And in it, you just get 
everything. You get the kind of orchestration he wrote. You get the kind of vocal writing that he wrote in his other works. You get all the kinds of fugues and the fugues that he he specially um, dedicated his efforts in the string quartets towards. Um, you get a, a real sense of form. You get uh, a sense of style, what kind of styles he liked to write. And you get this idea that one little motive can connect a long work of 30, 40, 50, 83 minutes. Today, we're going to talk about two of those, form and style. Um, so let me break that down first. So I call him the multi-musical maverick. So um, he would take regular forms and he would expand sections of those forms. He would um, break with tradition. So for example, if he had a minuet and trio, a very standard strict form, he would mess around with it just enough where you could recognize it as a minuet and trio, but really it was much more than that. He um, would take codas, the last little bits of the piece and expand them and make them longer so that by the time you're at the end of the piece, you have no choice but to jump up on your feet and go nuts with excitement. You have many different forms that he would incorporate into one style. So, you know, there's this one movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It's the scherzo where it's a scherzo, a sonata form and a fugue all in one. It's astonishing. Um, you get opera, you get uh, liturgical choral music and chant he references in his music of the, uh, in his more mature music. You get this sense of orchestra that has expanded to include trombones and contrabassoon and all of these marvelous instruments on a more regular basis. You get, he was really good at writing concertos because it wasn't just the soloist being featured with a background of orchestra, but they were truly um, integral to each other. And in Beethoven's late, late works, you get this um, concept of the menor core, the, this men's chorus. You hear it in Fidelio, and now you're going to hear it in the uh, Misa Solemnis as well. And you get even military references. You know, he was, he was really, um, interested in this idea of, a, of, of freedom and peace in the brotherhood of man and how that contradicted with, uh, with the uh, sense of military pride that was a result of the Napoleonic era. And so he would put those kinds of references in his music to make a point. And all of that, all of this, is in the Misa Solemnus. So yes, the Misa Solemnus is actually pure 100% Beethoven, not an oddball piece. The other thing you get is this sense of motivic unity. That's what we're going to explore also today. And that's the idea of taking one small little bit of music and turning it into something that unifies the whole piece. The best example of this is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So when you think of Symphony Number no. 5, I want you to think of one little phrase of music. You all know what it is. Think of it. It is. Short, 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 long. Short, 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 long. Right? That phrase, that V for victory phrase is the epitome of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But it's not just in this first movement. You'll hear it in the second movement. You hear it in the third movement. And you hear it in the last movement. So those four short notes that are introduced right at the beginning become the entire work. It's unbelievable, but that happens in the Misa Solemnus too. What you hear in the first eight bars or so 
is what you're going to hear in the next 83 minutes of this piece. So now I'm going to break my rule and we're just going to dive into singing this piece. Uh, my rule, of course, is that Misa Solemnus is a marathon and you probably shouldn't sing all the way through it without some uh, months of training, but I'll take it easy. Take things down the octave. Do what you can to be healthy, but let's explore this piece with our voices. So we're going to start with the Kyrie. And the Kyrie is pretty traditional in form in that you have the Kyrie followed by the Christe, the Christ have mercy, and then returning to the Kyrie eleison, the Lord have mercy. And he pretty much goes along with the liturgical setup of three Kyrie's, three Christe's, and then three Kyrie's. But there's a little tag and we're gonna sing that tag and it's gorgeous. So the little tag is his nod to uh, expanding form just a little bit. But what I wanna show you is the first eight bars. This is where that motivic unity really becomes clear. You hear the first big chord come in and then you hear a timpani strike. So right from the beginning, you know that there's gonna be an emphasis on this idea of anticipation. The chord comes in and then the timpani. So often we are hearing things in an anticipated way. Soon after that, the clarinet, one of his favorite instruments comes in and performs the gorgeous descending minor third. So those two things are going to appear throughout this movement. So those two things are going to appear throughout this movement and actually throughout the entire work. Here's our first excerpt, the beginning of the Kyrie. Listen to the big chord and then the fact that the timpani comes in after that chord starts. Then you're gonna hear the clarinet, the bassoon, and the oboe all do that descending minor third. So you've got these two motives all in the first about eight bars and then you're going to come in at letter A and you'll do the same thing. Here we go. <laughs>
here we are at the Christe, and you see here already you got your minor thirds going on here. Christe, Christe, all over the place. Now we're going to start at the bottom of the page, which is measure 98. Watch out for the page turn because you're coming in next again with some of those descending minor thirds. We'll go through the whole rest of the Christe singing through it. All right, so here's 98. And all of those minor thirds, and now we're back to that Kyrie, just as you would expect. And now we're going to close out the movement. Here, he allows us to hear that Kyrie text one more time, breaking that rule of three Kyries. And he gets the anticipation in there and the descending minor third. I mean, if you look at that final do-do in the soprano, it just breaks your heart. It's so beautiful. All right, we're starting. The music will start a little before M, and I'll start conducting right at M. Here's M, soprano alto. And now we get to the Gloria, and the Gloria doesn't have the same given structure that the Kyrie does. The Kyrie had a structure, Kyrie, then Credo, and then Kyrie. Well, the Gloria has to be developed around the progression of the text. But somehow, Beethoven, with his wily use of form, is able to create what I consider almost a four movement symphony. So if you look at the first measure, you get this and you're off like a rocket in this rousing allegro first movement. Then you get to measure, and I'm looking at my full my paper score here, you get to measure 230 which in the score I gave you is page 26. And that is this incredible larghetto, eighth note beat. It is definitely like a second movement. It, it, it feels like the, the soulfulness 
of one of his second movements of a string quartet or of a symphony. And then you get to the third movement, and it is this quoniam tu solus sanctus. And it is in three beats per measure. So it's almost, oh, you could think of it sort of like the minuet or the scherzo of a symphony. And then finally you get to these fugues, this, this incredible barn raising fugue at the end. And that is in measure 360, uh, otherwise known as um, page 36 in the score that I provided you. And that is our fourth movement. It, is, it almost feels like a fugue meets the last movement of Beethoven seven. It just goes on and on and on and on and doesn't stop. So that's how he is able to bring his own stamp to the mass through his use of form. Now, we also will have, of course, the anticipation and the descending minor third throughout. So we're gonna start at the beginning of this. We're gonna do a little bit of singing of the first movement and the second movement and the third movement. We're gonna leave the fourth movement, all those fugues, until our next meeting when we're having our fugathon. But let's start at the very beginning. So I want you to notice, let's start at the beginning of the Gloria. You will see the orchestra take off like a rocket and then the altos take off and the tenors take off and the basses take off and the sopranos take off. And soon enough, you start to notice that the end of each one of these phrases has that descending minor third. And I don't know, I mean, maybe it's just that I've studied this for so long that I start to see minor thirds everywhere, but Gloria in excelsis Deo, ba, da, ba, ba, et cetera, et cetera. You hear it over and over again. Then we're gonna turn the page and we're gonna get to, oh, approximately measure 50 or 51. This is page 18, second system. And then you start getting the anticipations. Look at that soprano part. One, two, bone voluntatis. There was no reason for him to do that, except for that it ties the whole work together. Then you get to this little fugato at the bottom of page 19, that's around measure 82, and you have a little anticipation. So it's one, two, glory. Fica tenor, glory, fica alto, glow. He could have just as easily gone one, two, three, glory, fica, but instead it's one, two, glory, fica. We're going to from the beginning of the Gloria, we're going to start at the beginning and go through that little fugato with those anticipation moments. Ready? fast, be careful.
Now I'll just say, notice that tenor, uh, the alto solo line coming up. Another beautiful anticipation. And now we get to the second movement of the Gloria, and that is the Larghetto at measure 230. And as I mentioned before, it is in eighth notes, so you'll see me conducting two, three, four, one, two. Sing a little bit of the solo parts coming up at the top of page 27, otherwise known as measure 237, and then we'll go through the first choral interjection. We will hit this section more when next week when we talk a little bit about how he uses the voice. But I just want you to hear how this feels like a second movement. I'll start conducting after the clarinet line. You'll know exactly where it is. <laughs> through this section in a week. And now let me draw your attention to the third movement of this Gloria symphony, and that is on the score that I gave you, page 34, measure 310, the Allegro Maestoso. Okay, and you'll see that it starts with the timpani, the pauken, and then you have this orchestra fortissimo section and it goes da 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 ba 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 we have our anticipation going on there in the orchestra doesn't happen in the chorus though let's do a little bit of that but before we do repeat after me say quo niam tu solu and then stop one, two, three. Quo niam tu solu. Don't go to Sanctus yet. One more time. Do not go to Sanctus. Just tu solu. Ready? Quo niam. This is everybody on the tenor part. One, two, three. Quo niam tu solu. Now do Sanctus. Sanctus. So we want to make sure we get that subito piano when we're singing through this section. All right, let's sing through this section. What I would suggest, though, is speak through it or take things down the octave. So uh, when you're looking at soprano part, for example, you've got that high A. Please do not sing that high A until it's concert day. Here's the orchestra.
gonna do it at our Fugathon next time we meet. But just know that this is kind of like the fourth movement of the Gloria Symphony. The only last thing to tell you is that Beethoven, in a stroke of genius, ties it all together, not just with the minor thirds and not just with that cool anticipation, but with a return to the opening strains, that Gloria in excelsis Deo. And he's got a surprise for you at the very, very end. Here's the transition to the very end. It's faster than the opening. I recommend not trying to sing it at all, just speak the text. So you're gonna do this. You're gonna look at letter, um, at, at page 48, measure 527. And you're gonna say, I'm gonna do the tenor part. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria, Gloria in excelsis Deo. One, two, three, one, two, three. In excelsis, in excelsis Deo. Okay, just try to speak through it or just follow through the score. When we do the fugues, we're gonna start slowly and build up the speed. Today is about an overview. All right, ready? Hold on to your seats. so much. And now we get to the credo with nine tempo changes and seven key changes. This piece is all over the place. He's really following the text in a way that is colorful and vibrant and a little chaotic at times. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the next two sessions diving into the credo. But there are a few things I want to point out as they relate to today's topic of of um, that motivic unity. And so we'll start right at the beginning where we have this opening. Boom, ga, ba, 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 ba. Right away, you have an anticipation. Boom, ba, and you have that minor third. Da, 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 ba. And as a bonus, you have a cross motive. You draw a line from this note to the last note of those four notes, and you would draw a line between the second and third note, and you have a cross. And this is something that Bach used, Handel used, Mozart used, all over their sacred music. And here he's using it every single time he says credo, or at least most of the times he says credo. So let's sing this opening, and we're gonna stop right before we get to the vocal gymnastics. for our topic on the way Beethoven used the voice. But let's skip ahead. You know, did you notice that the word credo, credo, credo 
almost seem more important than the details of the belief itself, well, that becomes particularly noticeable when we return to this later. So if you go all the way to measure 264, the allegro non, ma non troppo, measure 264, we're gonna sing this. And you notice he just sort of really quickly goes through all the details. Credo in spiritum sanctum, dominum et vivificantem, qui ex patre filium, qui ex patre filio simul adorato et cum glorificator. And what's really noticeable is just the repeat, the obsessive repeat of the credo. So listen to that and sing along. credo the fugue theme now again we're going to work on this on our next session but we did a warm-up we did the chattanooga choo-choo warm-up take a look at this fugue theme in the sopranos at the tom then to re seculi amen. You did this in the warm up. Ba -da 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 -ya -da 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 -da. Notice it's all descending thirds with a few exceptions. So F, F, D, B flat, passing tone, A flat, G, E flat. If you could keep going down, you would. E flat, C, A, F. So this whole fugue theme is made up of that descending third that we hear in the clarinet in the first eight bars of the Kyrie. We're gonna work on that next week. No need to do it right now. All right, on to the Sanctus. Hmm. And now we get to the Sanctus, which is a perfect example of Beethoven taking a fairly straightforward form and expanding it to give it more depth and meaning. Usually the Sanctuses have the following sections. A Sanctus and Plenis und Celi often have a powerful celebratory feel as if the angels are singing from heaven. Then you have an Osana in excelsis, a Benedictus usually performed by the solo vocal quartet, and then an exact repeat of the Osana in excelsis. In this case, you have a Sanctus, which is more internal, followed by a Pleni Sunt Celi, which is that angel celebration. Then you have the Osana in excelsis, which is like a little fugato, but then you have a Preludium, and this is not standard for the classical mass, but it would be standard part of the liturgy. This is where the priest would consecrate the host and would be accompanied by maybe an organist improvising. Well, here it's sort of a written out organ improvisation for orchestra. Then you go into the Benedictus, which instead of being a quartet for soloists is the most glorious violin concerto movement that Beethoven wrote. 
then you do go back to the Ozana Enoch Chelsea's, but in text only, not in music. And the Ozana has been changed by the Preludium and the Violin Concerto before it. So let's dive in just a little bit, although we will be doing some of this in our fugue work later on. So let's start, well, at the very beginning. And why don't you sing the solo parts? Because when do you get to do that? Here we go. are trombones. party. <laughs> and that's for Fugathon. Now let's go to the Benedictus, the most unusual moment in the entire piece where the violin and two flutes enter from up high as if the spirit is descending upon us like a dove. And Underneath that Holy Spirit, you have this reference to the Middle Ages in the bass part. The chorus bass part is paired with the violin, and they sing, Benedictus, qui venit in nomine domini. Let's all do that together, and I want you to embody your inner monk. One, two, three. Benedictus, qui venit in omine domini. What a stunning moment. Let's listen and sing along if you like. We're going to start at about measure 111. I want you to notice after you're done singing that bass part, the Benedictus, listen to the trombones. They take over the chorus part. Thank you. 
trombones. traditional solo quartet starts to enter. Before we move on to the final movement for today, I want to share one quotation with you about this movement, and that is from Robert Shaw. He said, the Benedictus is the vast, timeless repose towards which the Gloria and the Credo have been rushing. And now we go to the Agnus Dei. Now, if the Benedictus was a violin concerto, the Agnus Dei is an opera all the way. It has recitative, it has aria-like moments, it has dramatic back and forth between characters, it has trumpets that sound like those offstage trumpets you might expect in an operatic scene. And because it deals with many different ways we can use the human voice, we're going to dive into it a little bit in one of our next sessions. But what I'd like to do is, again, point out some of those things that make it unique in terms of form and in terms of using that idea of motive to unify the entire piece. So first, the form. Just like the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei is typically straightforward. It just has three sections. Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis, that Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Then that's repeated verbatim. And then it's repeated almost verbatim, but instead of have mercy on us, it's dona nobis pacem, grant us peace. Well, Beethoven takes that and turns it into a musical statement on war and peace, it's, it's frankly astonishing. So he starts with an Agnus Dei, Miserere Nobis, at measure one. And he does that about three times, so you sort of think, ah, he's following the rules. Then he goes into this incredibly comforting, beautiful Dona Nobis Pacem. But then, that is interrupted with a military style interjection with trumpets and a mezzo soprano recitative, and then a cry out from the chorus, Miserere nobis, and we'll practice that at a subsequent session. Then, the Dona nobis returns, peaceful, reverent. But then it is interrupted again by a frantic orchestral interlude. It's marked presto. And that culminates in the chorus again, screaming out, Dona nobis pacem, as if one last yell will make it happen. And then finally, we have a return to that incredibly peaceful Dona nobis pacem. And Beethoven, who's used to ending in a way that brings people to their feet, ends like he does with the pastoral symphony in this beautiful, comforting, rocking motion. Like, as if to say, yes, we will have peace. And of course, then the next year he finishes his ninth symphony. 
we're going to sing the end of this now, and we'll start at the very tail end of the last military interjection. We're going to start on my page 120. This is measure 326, and uh, feel free to sing that first interjection, that Agnus, Agnus Dei, and then you'll hear those military trumpets come in, but then we'll bring it to a close and pay careful attention to that last soprano line. Here we go. much for coming and listening and we'll see you at the next event.